Good day. I'm Tara Tuatai, pioneer of FeathedAndFree.com and administrator on TheBridge.net. And we're very fortunate to have with us today a famous um, expert on bird behavior, Dr. Susan Friedman, all the way from the United States of America. And she's going to be uh, talking to us about parrot behavior, some things that we can look for, and ways that we can improve our relationship with our own pet parrots. So, Susan, welcome to FeathedAndFree.com. Thank you. Now today, in your lecture, you were talking about um, the antecedents of things that we should look for um, that's happened in the parrot to cause the behavior. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important thing that I teach about is that behavior never occurs alone. Mm -hmm. Behavior is always sandwiched between antecedent environment, things that predict it, mm -hmm. and consequences that make the behavior of value for the animal. So when we want to understand why an animal behaves the way it does, why does our parrot bite or scream or not stay put, then we need to look at the things that happen before the behavior that predict that that behavior will occur, and we need to look at why is that serving a purpose for the animal, the consequence. Okay, so sometimes we don't always know what has caused the behavior. We may have a secondhand parrot, you know, we buy it from Craigslist or a rescue, or it could just be a giveaway bird that somebody's dumped off. We don't know um, what, what might have happened to traumatize this poor parrot. And so how can we try to get around that and help the bird? Well, a parrot's history is certainly uh, part of how we predict what they're going to do today. But the most important predictors come from the condition the parrot lives in today. So what we want to do is make sure that we provide an environment today where the parrot's good behavior produces valued consequences, and that makes them more likely to do that good behavior. For example, if a bird is biting when it's up high on top of its cage, what we can do is shape very slowly movement towards our hand in return for something of value, like a sunflower seed. And if we don't push the parrot and we give the parrot a choice to come towards us for the seed or to stay away but not get the seed, chances are the parrot will start to come closer to us and we can reinforce each small step towards us and teach them that coming towards us is a value, going away gets nothing. So we can change that history with current positive experiences. Okay, now what if a parrot is afraid of hands? This is probably one of the most common problems. Like you, you get this adorable little parrot and all you want to do is get him to step up and you want to give him so much love and it's like you know he's been in a bad situation and it's like, what can you do? It's like you, you want to show this parrot that you love him and you want him to trust you. Well, when I hear the word trust, my mind immediately thinks, what does that mean? What does a person have to do? What does it look like to earn trust from a parent? And I think that the biggest part of trust is when an animal predicts that being near you produces positive outcomes for the animal. Then, given a choice to approach you or to go away, the animal goes towards you. And that's what we mean by trust. So the first thing we have to do to get an animal to trust us is to provide a high density of positive outcomes. That might be just walking by the cage and dropping a treat food in. It might even be stepping back when we see a defensive posture, showing the animal that at the end of the day they have some control over their own outcomes. And if we do that, keep pairing positive outcomes with our presence, then learning by association will occur, and the animal will see us, the parrot will see us, and look to bring us up. Now, the, one of the other things that we're talking about was not labeling a behavior. For example, um, uh, what was it, an, an antagonized parrot that you were using as an, an example? Agitated an agitated parrot. parrot. That's that's a verb, or an, it's an adjective that describes um, a parrot. But what you you really want to look for is an action that the parrot is doing, exactly. and not not trying to interpret what you think the parrot is feeling. That's right. Mm -hmm. Labels are a big obstacle to helping parrots with their behavior living among humans because labels, as you say, exactly so, are just adjectives. They're not mm -hmm. behavior. So when we label parrots, we label them jealous, mean, ornery, um, nasty, all of these dominant, hormonal, none of those labels describe what the parrot does that I can see with my eyes and the conditions under which it does it. So if we throw away the label and instead focus on what we can see the parrot doing and the conditions when the parrot does it, we'll get much further in understanding how to change the problem behaviors into desirable behaviors. 
For example, some people may say that a bird screaming is neurotic. But what does neurotic look like? It could be one of a variety of behaviors. When you tell me it's screaming all day long, when you're in another room, now I have something I can work with. The behavior is long duration vocalizing, and it happens most likely when you're not in the room. And the purpose it probably serves is to bring you back into the room. So now I have the antecedents, you're gone. I have the observable behavior, long duration screaming, and I have the purpose it serves to bring you back. Now we can talk about changing the environment so that the bird may have a different way of bringing you back into the room. We also might want to teach the bird to do independent activities like foraging so that they need your attention less. And in that way, we change the environment to change the bird. We don't jump down the bird's throat to try and explain why it's doing what it's doing. It's not a label. It's behavior that the bird repeats because it has a purpose for the bird. Okay, so um, let's say you're, if you're at work all day and the bird is screaming and disturbing the neighbors, that's a very common situation and I've seen a lot of people on our um, message board that have had to rehome their birds because the neighbors are complaining. So what can you do to try to um, prevent this from happening so people are not having to rehome their parrots? Yeah, another great question. Part of the problem with a parrot who people report is screaming all day even though nobody's home is figuring out what function that serves, what purpose does that screaming serve. It might appear that it can't be attention because nobody's home to provide attention. However, there's another very tricky thing about behavior, and that is the schedule of reinforcement. If the schedule is intermittent, like when we play a slot machine, that will build a very strong, persistent behavior. It might be that that parrot screams for your attention because one time you happened to get your keys, turned around, and went back just the moment the parrot was vocalizing. And then you may not come back in again for another three months. But the parrot is on a gambler schedule. That parrot is in a pulling the slot machine arm for a thousand pulls on the one-off chance that you may come back in. So those intermittent schedules of reinforcement are really, really difficult to beat. In the case where we can't control that schedule of reinforcement, our best bet is to compete with an alternate behavior that is even more rewarding than the screaming. So it means we have to buckle down and start to train that parrot to use its behavior healthfully and independently by playing with foraging toys, chewing wood, um, opening cups and such for food. And it may take us several months to train the parrot to do all of those enrichment behaviors that we can then slowly replace the screaming with. We give them more attention for them playing with toys than for them doing nothing. And the science of behavior tells us that over time, they will play with toys more because not only did it get our attention, but it also has natural reinforcement of being active. So in the case you describe, it probably is attention-based, but on a very lean gambler schedule. That's a tough behavior to change. Mm -hmm. So the way to approach it is to think about what do we want the parrot to do instead, and then train those alternate behaviors. That's excellent advice. And I'm so grateful for you to join it, joining us here in Feathered and Free. And thank, thank you so much. And My pleasure. Thank you for joining us, and I'm Tara Tuatai for feathered and free .com. wishing to see you again on one of our next interviews.